Good morning. Those of us who are out of bed early and want to start our day with stretching our bodies after three days of a very energetic conference. Now, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to begin um, and I'm going to ask those of you who are down the back to come up near the front, if you can. And I know that you remember that I don't see very well, so you think you'll get away with it. So I'm going to walk down the room and encourage those of you sitting in a chair down the back to come up to the front. And uh, AV guys, will you make sure there's people come out, come into the room? Right. So we are day three, the final day of the Zero Project Conference. And I think those of you who've been with us, we have tried to make sure the conference is more experiential. Um, and we've had film to start our day for the last two days. And we had dance yesterday. But today we are absolutely delighted to welcome Anastasia Goretz from the Pilates Cafe in Germany. And she's gonna help us start the day in a different movement. So what I'm asking, inviting you all to do is put down those phones, get your head out of your laptop. Anastasia is going to give us a brief presentation and then she's going to walk us through Pilates to stretch our spines and our necks and our bodies so that we fully come into the room for this last day of the conference. So without further ado, can you please give a very warm welcome to Anastasia. Muscles up. My name is Anastasia Goretz, and uh, I'm legally blind. I overcame my disability and became a Pilates instructor. I promote movement as the best medicine. My Pilates Cafe project is all about accessible movement with pleasure. We were all born to move. Unfortunately, it is not always that we can provide our bodies the needed amount of movement in order to stay healthy and um, promote our well-being. This is especially true for people with disabilities. One of the problems is a lack of accessible fitness inclusive opportunities. My six-year experience shows that uh, Pilaris is the most accessible and suitable for everyone exercise system. Joseph Pilaris, in his book, Return to Life, wrote, changes happen through movement and movement heals. Here in this workout, I will help your bodies just a little bit open, get some movement, get some air. We will stretch our necks, we'll do something that will help burn your breakfast and to get your brain activated for this wonderful day. And especially get ready for the dancing tonight. How about dancing? Yes. <laughs> so what is Pilaris? Pilaris um, is uh, focusing on the balanced development of the body through core strings, flexibility, and awareness in order to support efficient and graceful movement. Pilaris was developed by Joseph Pilaris and is also known as Pilaris method. Exercise modification is the key to Pilaris' success with so many populations. The best thing is about Pilaris is that it works so well for a wide range of people. Athletes and dancers love it, as do seniors, prenatal and postnatal women, people at any stage and level of physical rehabilitation. All the exercises are developed with modifications, and uh, those modifications can both make a workout safe, and um, the workout can be also challenging. It can challenge a person at any level of physical development. 
Pilates exercises are done either on the mat on the floor or on Pilates equipment. Pilates equipment is especially good for people with disabilities as it provides the needed support for any kind of limb, for any kind of need. I especially love reformer. It has um, some ropes and loops and special support providing. It provides resistance, it provides um, uh, support, and it can also develop awareness for our bodies. So I'm offering a short Pilates workout for you. The Pilates workout is about making our core strong. And um, by employing the pelvic floor muscles, all the abdominal muscles, and making them work in harmony with our back muscles. As you engage your core, you can get some support for your lumbar spine. This is especially safe for any kind of movement. For example, flexion forward. So please come and join whoever is still there in the corridor and just take your seat and let's do the chair workout. If any level of the exercise causing some kind of acute pain, please stop doing the exercise immediately. But it should not, because this is very pre-pilaris exercise, which is very beginner level. So let's start with breathing. Breathing is a very important act of our life. We were born, born, born with um, breath, correct? Yes. And breathing heals. Whenever you get uh, anxious or um, you worry about something, just take a deep breath. So let's start with breathing. Open your throat just a little bit so it provides more the, of the airflow. Sit super tall in your chair. Find the center of your seat bones. Imagine that your seat bones are the hills of the mountain. And don't slide those tops of the mountains. Sit super tall. Then find the crown of your head. It's right here where my hair is done. And move it into the ceiling. You can feel your neck now being stretched a little bit. So, you're super tall. Let's make inhale through your nose. Inhale deeply and feel the air flowing to your um, spine column. It's going to your upper chest. And then it makes your ribs going sideways. And then it flows down to your lumbar spine, your pelvis. Let your belly pop up a little bit. You let your abdominals pull up, don't compress it. And then go back with exhale the other way around. So your pelvis, abdominals, lower back, spinal chest, and ribs, and then finish. Expel all the air. Imagine as it all goes out of you. Let's do it just a few more times. Inhale through your nose, go down, down, while going big different directions and come back other way, your pelvis, your belly. Don't be too fast with exhaling. Exhale as long as possible. Usually the exhale should be longer than your inhale. Let's do it a few more times. Inhale, nose, throat, and your neck, and your upper chest, and your pelvis, and then come back other directions. And the other way, inhale, go wide, and exhale through your mouth. Super cool. Now, the pre pilaris exercise is about finding your neutral spine. We will move some of your lumbar vertebrae. They are right here. And we will move some of your pelvis and we will help yourself with breathing. So, the exercise goes like this. Inhale to prepare. Exhale and Press your lumbar spine into the chair. Press it. Inhale to release and exhale and move your lumbar spine away from the chair. Let's do it again. 
Inhale to prepare. Exhale and press your lumbar spine into the chair. Exhale and come back. Let's do it again. Inhale to prepare. Exhale and move it away from the chair. Inhale to prepare. Exhale, do it again. Somewhere in the middle of these two points is a neutral spine. It's where the three curves of your spine are observed. It's a natural position of your spine. So let's do it just one more time. Move your lumbar spine towards your chair and then away from your chair and then come back to the middle. You feel now relaxed and you are now tall. The next exercise is called head nod. Do you usually do it like this, correct? You just nod your hair and uh, your head. So this exercise, it lengthens your neck. Uh -huh. And lengthening of your spine is about Pilaris. In Pilates, we always become very tall. As in the beginning, we were taught to become tall, to sit and center yourself on the chair, correct? So now you will do the head nod. With inhale, you will tuck your chin into the chest and look what happens. My head is not going down. It's not going into the flexion. It's going up, and through the lengthening of my neck, I do this exercise. So lengthen your neck and move your chin into the chest with an inhale, exhale to come back. Your head is in line with your spine always. It's lined up. Let's do it again. Inhale and tuck your chin into the chest and your head crown is going up into the ceiling. It's becoming super long. You are gaining two more centimeters of your height. Just imagine, you are higher, you are growing, and come back. The last one. Let's do it, the head knot. Lengthen your neck. Release your muscles. Make them long, stretch them, and come back. This exercise is integral for so many Pilates exercises that aim to flex your spine forward or do the rolling exercises. Flexion of your spine is usually done like this, and extension, it goes different way. So flexion, your spine is moving forward and down. Extension, it's moving back and opening your chest. The next exercise is about arms. So it helps to find the placement of our shoulders and our arms and also our scapulas. Let's do it like this. Move your arms forward so they are parallel with the floor. Find probably your neighbor if it's possible. So try to feel it and move your shoulders super down, away from your ears, and your head becomes so tall again with the long neck, beautiful long neck. Think about the ballet dancers, huh? They have long necks and shoulders down. So we are moving our arms forward, and they are parallel with the floor. Your palms can face either down or the ceiling, it doesn't matter. So with inhale, move your arms forward and open your scapulas. Feel your scapulas opening. Move them forward, keeping your shoulders down. Exhale to come back to your neutral position. That's where you started. Inhale and move your arms back. Keep them straight. And move your scapulas closer to each other in this exercise and come back to the neutral. So first thing is that we are moving our arms forward, trying to touch our neighbor, and then come back to the neutral. And the other, with inhale, move your shoulders back and touch scapulas to each other. Open your chest front and come back. The last repetition. Move your arms forward, open your scapulas, keeping your shoulders down and your head long, and come back. And the last one, bring your scapulas closer to each other, 
and come back. Now, keeping your arms still here, you can already feel your deltoid muscles challenged, right? Now, with inhale, you will move your arms up into the ceiling and still keep your shoulders down. This exercise helps to keep your torso aligned while challenged. So let's move your arms forward, keep your shoulders down, and come back. How does it feel? Good. And move your shoulders down and your arms up, and come back. The last two times. Inhale, keep your torso aligned and your head touching the ceiling, and come back. And the last one. Inhale and move your arms up into the ceiling, and come back. Good job, pretty tired. Move your arms down and relax your shoulders. Kind of pull them into the ears and down, relax. Now, the next exercise is for those usually sitting at a desk or in their chairs. We will uh, open your chest. So first, move your arms down and line them with your body. Now, flex your elbows. So your forearm is parallel with the floor and your palms facing down. With inhale, move your shoulders and scapulas back. Scapulas are going down, shoulders going down, and your chest is open and come back. Now, as you move your shoulders down and open your chest, we will add some head and neck work. We will look right and then find your left shoulder. So let's try. And open your chest and move your shoulders and scapulas down and back. Now hold your breath and look right and find your left shoulder and come back. Let's do it again. Open your chest so quality way. And right, look to your right, and look to your left, and come back. Don't forget that we're holding your breath. Inhale, and move your shoulders back. And look to your right, and look to your left, and come back. Good job. The next exercise is super challenging while it is done on the floor or on the exercise equipment. But we're sitting, so still try to challenge yourself. It is developed to increase your blood circulation, to develop your core muscles, to develop your pelvis stabilization. So let's try. Um, move your arms forward. Uh -huh. Flex your uh, shoulders so your arms are parallel with the floor. Now we're just prepared, so your palms are facing forward. Mm -hmm. Now, for five beats, you're gonna imagine as you are slapping the water on the ocean, and the water is super high density. We will pulse five times, keeping your shoulders down. Five, four, three, two, one. Now, rotate your palm into the ceiling and keep pulsing. Five, four, three, two, one. Good job. So the challenge would be, as you inhale, you pulse five times. As you exhale, you pulse five times. Okay? So let's do it. Remember that you are slapping the high-density water on the ocean. You are swimming. Let's do it. Five, four, three, two, one. Back, five, four, three, two, one. Now, sit super tall in your chair, engage your core, and go up as much as you can, and um, pull your navel or the belly button into the spine. And let's pulse. Five, four, three, two, one. Stay strong. Five, four, three, two, one. Feel your deltoids. Five, four, three, two, one. Feel your triceps. Five, four, three, two, one. Good job. Keep doing. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's do it. Five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one. Go stronger. Five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one. The last two. 
And the last one, and relax. Whew. Did you feel your deltoids a little bit? We made our deltoids and shoulders strong. We did some triceps work, biceps work, and some core alignment. The next exercise about engaging your core. So it's not just engaging of your belly muscles. No, it's not that. It's about engaging your pelvic floor muscles. Imagine as your pelvis is going up, squeeze your glutes, squeeze your seed bones, squeeze everything you have down here. Then go, the actual pull in begins just on the top of your pubic bone. So from here you start engaging and then you come to your belly button and some people can feel then an extra lift of your abdominals becoming higher. So let's try to do it again. Your pelvis floor, pelvic floor, and your pubic bone, and your belly button, and your extra lift. So come taller again. And just one tip, the actual pull in is not about moving your belly button toward your spine. It's about also from side to side. So don't forget to engage it from side to side. Let's do it again. Pull your belly button in and squeeze everything and become super tall. And remember about your nice and tall neck. Mm -hmm. And come back. One more time, just squeezing and going super tall. And feel all the muscles of your um, belly and uh, of your abdominals. And go up and down. Good job. The next exercise is about spinal rotation. Take your right hand and place it on your left shoulder. Mm -hmm. And left hand and place it on your right shoulder. You will get your elbows bent. Mm -hmm. Now again, your neck is super tall and you're sitting super tall and your core is activated, correct? Remember about the core. So we will do some spinal rotation. Usually as we do some rotation, like looking to your right or left, um, our vertebras tend to press to each other. We don't want that because they can press our vertebral discs. We don't want that. We want to become super tall, super tall and stretched. So let's try rotation to your right side and become taller as you rotate and to your left side. A few more tips. You will need to stabilize your pelvis. Do not move it. Is that okay? So center yourself on your seat bones, become super tall, place your hands on your shoulders and let's do the rotation. Engage your belly and rotate to your right side and become super tall with your tall neck and to your left side. Inhale and rotate. Let's do it again. Inhale and rotate. One more time. Inhale and rotate. Good job and here we go. Now, it's all about lateral flexion. I see that you have more space around, so we will stretch your arms out. Again, keeping your shoulders super down. Keep them down. As you keep your shoulders down, you may feel your scapulas going forward. Scapulas are your shoulder blades. They are attached to your back on top of you. They may pop up or whatever they can happen. They may hurt you. We don't want that. We want them to move down and open your chest and slide them forward. Now, we'll do the lateral flexion. Keep your shoulders down. Keep your arms like this. Imagine right now you have an egg. Egg in your right side. So as you flex to your right, do not break this egg. You will need to flex the way that can open your left ribs more. So keeping your shoulders down, imagine your egg in your right side, flex and open your left ribs 
and come back. Let's do it with inhale. Inhale to prepare. Exhale as you laterally flex. And now opening your right ribs. Go the way that your chest would be parallel with the uh, stage. Let's do it again. Inhale and exhale as you flex laterally and come back. Inhale and exhale as you flex around. Do not forget to do just extra thing to open your right ribs, for example, and come back. One more, inhale, exhale as you flex and come back. And the last one, inhale as you flex and come back and move your arms down and relax them again. Did you feel challenged a little bit? If you, it's possible, move your right hand up and say you are challenged. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so now we're gonna uh, move your arms and place them behind your head. You may get your fingers crossed now. Move your shoulders down so your chest is open. Mm -hmm. So now move your shoulders up into your ears. Move them and move them down, sliding your scapulas down. <sighs> Let's do it again. Inhale, move your shoulders up and move your shoulders down. Keep doing. Inhale and move your shoulders up and move your shoulders down. Notice your scapulas. Inhale and move your shoulders up and down. One more. Inhale and move your shoulders up and down. The last one. Inhale and move your shoulders up and down and release your arms and go them down again. So what we did, we stabilized your pelvis. We challenged your core a little bit. We opened your chest. We did some flexion. We did some scapula and shoulder work. We found your placement. So important in Pilates to keep your head and neck super tall and long, to open your chest, to increase the power of your core. The core is not just abdominal muscles, it's the pelvic floor, it's the abdominal muscles, it's your back muscles, and guess what? It's a diaphragm, because breathing is important. I want to tell you one secret about the diaphragm. As it is filled with the air, so when you inhale, it goes down, and it is filled with the air. So goes head down with our neck. As we exhale, diaphragm goes up and our head goes up. They move together. As diaphragm goes down, head goes down. As diaphragm goes up and head goes up. So what's important about this? As you exhale, your neck is also relaxed. Whenever you feel like your upper back is challenged, and this is so hard to keep your shoulders nice and relaxed, then just exhale more deeply. Exhale to release your neck. It's all about breathing. Breathing changes life. Breathing changes uh, everything. Breathing is about anxiety. Breathing is about the power of life. Um, so let's finish with breathing. Place your right hand on your right ribs. Place your left hand on your left ribs. And let's inhale and extend your ribs different direction. And exhale and help yourself with your hands to move them in. Let's do it again. Inhale and move your ribs different directions. Exhale and move them in. One more time. Inhale in different direction and exhale deeply. <sighs> move them in. So I hope you liked this work, Pilates workout. And just a few pictures and a few things about my presentation. Uh, this slide shows what Pilates is. Just for those of you who were not here, I'll tell you, it's focusing the balanced, balanced, developing 
of the body. It's not about particular group of the muscles. It's about your body as a whole thing. Uh, it does so through core strength, through flexibility, and through awareness in order to support and to facilitate the efficient moment and graceful moment. It is done on the floor, on the mat, or it is usually done on the Pilaris equipment. My favorite piece of equipment is Reformer. It provides so much support. Uh, so on this exercise, it's um, a picture showing how much Pilaris challenges and changes how we look. Um, it absolutely changes our shape. It makes us longer. It's not a strong workout like a, a gym. It's also not a very simple workout. It's still super challenging. Just imagine, athletes and dancers love it, as do seniors, as do prenatal and postnatal women, and uh, people at different stage of rehabilitation. Uh, the principles of Pilaris is breathing, it's um, centering, concentration. It's all about the body itself. It's about realizing what you are doing, what, where your scapulas are, where your belly is, where your pelvic floor is. It's about knowing how you look. Um, the pictures show uh, my project in Ukraine was called Time 4. I worked for inclusive Pilates studio. And here in these pictures, there are um, visually impaired children from the School of the Blind. We had a Pilates day and they tried Pilates. Later, every Saturday, they came and I helped them to exercise. We worked on their postures. We did some scoliosis prevention. We helped uh, breathing actions and uh, improved the abdominal strings. Uh, These uh, pictures uh, show also the inclusive project called Fitness for All. I couldn't say it Pilates for All because not the people could know what Pilates is. So that was Fitness for All. Many different types of uh, people with disabilities came and uh, those were hard hearing people and hard seeing people and blind people, different people. I could do my best. Uh, during one hour, we had not so many exercises, but still they were very accessible. And uh, that project was wonderful for everyone. And um, on this project, uh, there are wheelchair people just like we did exercising. Um, and uh, they did more exercises because they were able to use different types of equipment. For example, this one on this picture is a Pilates equipment called Spine Corrector. So from the name, you can understand that it helps to increase awareness where the spinal vertebras are. Those are like seven neck vertebras and 12 thoracic vertebras and five lumbar spine and others. So uh, we did, you can see ribs opening and um, uh, it doesn't show, but we can do some spinal extension, your chest opening and uh, we can do the flexion, we can do the pelvic opening. Everything is done on the Pilates equipment. Um, and uh, this is my favorite one, reformer. On this picture, you can see a person doing a footwork. So usually you may uh, see like squats. Uh, as you can be challenged, you may do some squats, but if you cannot do it, if your spinal column is challenged and it is not possible for you to do it. You may just lay down, relax, and reformer will do it for you. <laughs> so please, um, I really recommend you to find your Pilates studios, to ask for Pilates teachers. 
And as for me, I really develop and promote Pilates method as the most accessible exercise fitness. It was developed by Joseph Pilates for the uh, injured soldiers. And um, for example, a soldier does not have one of the limbs. Uh, they could just lay down on the reformer and uh, put uh, his or her foot into the loop of the stripes and just exercise. So it provides rehabilitation. And that would be such a good idea if um, or we could have those accessible studios, more inclusive teachers. Thank you for coming and uh, listening and exercising, and please enjoy your day. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, I hope everybody is uh, sitting taller and feeling taller. And I think the other thing is about feeling confident when we sit taller and we stand taller. So thank you so very much. Um, really appreciate you coming so early in the morning. And also thank you because English is not your first language as well. So thank you very much. Real round of applause for Anastasia. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you for your time. So, so how are we all feeling? Feeling a little bit warm and stretched in the body? Okay. So we have another surprise for you this morning just to get you fully present in this room. So you can hear there's some noise going on over here. We are absolutely delighted. You've heard a lot about Luminous over the Luminous Foundation over the last few days. And what we decided to do to be the final morning of the Zero Conference, aside from stretching Pilates, is to open our mind with a story. So the Luminous Foundation are going to come and tell us a story with a performance. Now, Zatla is going to be our storyteller. Though this is not audio description, because this is done in silence, Zatla is going to tell us the story commentary for those of us who can't see, so that you can have an imagining on what is happening here on the stage. And the reason that this was chosen as a way for us to tell this story is because the performers have three languages between them. And it was hard to choose which was the language that we were going to use. And it just shows us how difficult to rate real inclusion a reality. So this is how we have decided it is best to engage and communicate with everyone. So a wordless performance with a wonderful storyteller and we will be able to fully, I don't know, fully participate as much as we can. So Zatla, would you like to come up and take the mic? I can't, oh, here we are. Here we go. So can you please give a round of applause for Zatla, our storyteller for this morning. Thank you very much. So I would like to say uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Latka, and I would love to introduce you our work with our international group of self young self-advocates from Moldova, Bulgaria, and Czech Republic. Because during All Zero Project conference for all three days, we had a lot of parallel side sessions where we worked very hard, and we threw we tried to create kind of uh, expressive performance for you during these days right here on the Zero Project Conference. So we tried to work through the expressive techniques as uh, works with voice, uh, with art, then with body movements and try to let young people share their stories through this way. And uh, then we just help them a bit to put the story together and put some words which uh, are actually their own expressions which they use and which they came up through these three days. How, how they feel and uh, how they work with uh, the topic of being an institution on the, one, on the one side and to be independent, to live independently on the other side. So we would love now to invite you to experience and enjoy this performance and I will try to be kind of moderator, storyteller and commentator at once <laughs> to, uh, to be more accessible for people who can't see it, for example. So we will try our, our best to, um, that you, you can enjoy. You can enjoy and you can join, of course, to, to share 
and to listen their voices and their messages. So I'd like to invite our group from Moldova, Bulgaria and Czech Republic right now. So now young people are coming and they are hidden behind the wall, behind the symbol of the wall as a piece of a cloth. So now you can see the wall and you can see the shades of the children behind the wall. So let's all now listen to the true story about the walls and barriers and opportunities, how they could, they could be broken. You can help, you can be now part of the story. So now you can see the shades of the young people who are behind the wall. Because in the world there are still many walls and behind them there are a lot of children. And the children, they are part of the wall. Now let's have a look. Let's have a look how it looks inside. How it looks behind the wall. And now the cloth falls down. And now you can see just the young people, just children, who are in the institution, who are behind the walls. There are babies, children and young adults, somehow still invisible, and not noticed and ignored by the people. They are left behind. All young people, they have on their backs some labels. And we symbolize them by letters of the word institution. So each child has one of these letters which symbolize institution. You can see them. You can see their faces. But what do you think? How they feel? How they feel there? What are in their thoughts? What are their emotions? What do you think? Can I ask you now? You can get your bubbles, and please, just a couple of you, if you can think, if you see it. What are the emotions? What are the feelings? And please, if anybody is happy to help us, my colleagues will give you one bubble. Just spread them. She will spread them between a couple of you. And just please think about it in a couple of minutes. And then I will ask to shout them out, if you'll be happy about this, or you can just think and you don't have to write them. The children behind the wall, they have a coat. They did not choose it, they just got it. When they talked about them, the carers, they don't use their names. They are just like, you are code number four. They are like anything. Some of them can be in isolation because maybe bad challenging or challenging behavior. And they just cannot be with other kids because somebody decided. They are alone for a long time, unknown by the world. Can I ask now, now somebody, just shout out. Just shout out one feeling, one emotion you have. How you can feel about this. And then they will share with you, of course. Is anybody brave here to shout out just whichever feeling, emotion, comment, word? It can be just a word. Lonely, great, thank you. Whatever. Sad. Sad. Perfect, thanks. Crucian? Crucian, thanks. Hopeless. Thank you very much. So, you can see them, but do we really know how they feel there? What are their thoughts? You can see it's written in their faces. Yeah. 
barrier between me and community, broken rights, aggressive and cruel, no life. No love, without any love, prison. But the children need just support. They need to be heard. They don't want to be left behind. And now you could see the children were standing with sad faces in front of them, which they created during the session by art. And now, kind of plastic foil is in front of them. These children and young people, they have power. Their voices are strong. Children have the chance to get out of institution or either not to get inside because we know solution. Because loving family who can support them to cope with all struggles and to help them. And now representatives of family came with a light as a symbol to hope and help, and they helped them to get out. And now you can see them, how they feel right now. They are very strong now because they are out, they are independent, they can feel it. Joy, power, love and freedom, mixed feelings, freedom. Go home and be with the family. Happiness. New future. And now, please, let's help us again. How do you feel about this? We have now young people are standing with the happy faces or maybe faces uh, about the freedom feelings and they feel independently. So they have, again, their masks and they are from the opposite side. They created these masks during the workshops as well. So let's help us now. What are your feelings? How do they feel? How do you feel about, to, about to being independent? Let's again shout out about the feelings, about the comments and whatever. Happy. Happy. Heartful. Hope. Hope. Sorry. Hope. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks. Empowered. 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 Thanks. Love. Yeah, thank you. Love. Great. Thank you very much. But. Even after young people or children leave the institution. They still somehow carry these labels, even with the support of their families, of their peers, of their friends. They can raise up in loving family, but sometimes they carry these labels forever because they are somehow labeled forever in their mind. That's it. <laughs> and now, 
just we would love to involve you in our kind of special ritual because now we were in a big pressure about this performance so we would love to share with you and invite you to do kind of volcano all together just to feel the energy that we are all here so are you ready let's go and you can just follow us just stand up if you can or you can say of course because everybody can do this Do you have your hands? So now we will switch on our energy. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so we will switch off our energy in our hands. We buy your hands. Have a look what we are doing and you are just follow us. Okay, turn on. Energy starting. I can feel it. It's growing, growing. Now put on your tables or to the ground. Yes, 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 and it's going to your body. It's in your body, in your bump also, in your uh, belly, belly bump, I don't know, here, <laughs> chest. It's going up, it's going up, and whoa! Yeah, thank you very much, thank, thank you. Thank you guys, can make a round of applause, come on. Woo! Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Woo. Go on again. Go on, give it again. Come on. One, two, three. We are moves. Ready? No, no. Daddy. Doesn't matter. One, two, three. We are Lumos. Woo. Woo. Well done. The Lumos Foundation and all the guys. Thank you so much. Woo. And thank you, Zatla, for the great storytelling. Okay, well, are we all awake now? We definitely are. Okay, so we are going to switch around, are we going to switch around the program a little bit because the president of the Austrian parliament is a little bit late and we want to make sure our day keeps on time. He is on his way. So what we're going to do, in, we are going to actually have our couch session with Tom Butcher first and then it will be followed by the president within the next 40 minutes. So Tom, can we bring, oh, and the couch is just arriving. So how is everybody doing this morning? We're good? Yeah. I mean, oh, we're all tired, right? Because there's so much going on, but I think energized with solutions. So I think happy tired maybe, or energized tired. So we are delighted now to bring Tom to the couch. And you've got all your people here on time. I'm very impressed, all about solutions. Very efficient, okay. Now, let's get everybody in. Okay, now, can I give anybody a mic? Okay, Tom, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Yes, thank you. Big pardon? Yes, just four guys, sorry about that. We can't have four guys. We can't have a panel with four white belts. I'm not taking oh, yeah? part of a panel with four guys. Yeah, I'm, oh, I, I, I'm more than happy to sit on it. Yeah. Can I help? Do you want some water? Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much indeed for joining us for the final couch session of um, this conference. I'm here today with some acknowledged and respected authorities in the sphere of personal assistance, budget and budget management, and inclusion. And inclusion. <laughs> disruption. <laughs> no disruption there. And um, so, I'm not going to say anything more except to introduce my fellow panelists. I have on my right, 
as you know, Caroline Casey, who's joining us today. Oh my God, that's loud. Um, I have Professor Tom Shakespeare on my right. I have Joris van Payenbroek on my left. And I have Germain Weber on his left. And what I should like to do is ask each of my panelists, starting with Tom, to tell us a wee bit about themselves and then the absolutely incredible work that they've been doing. And then after that, I'm actually going to um, talk with them on about, with any luck, two or three issues, maybe more, that um, we would like to examine, particularly vis-a-vis -vis models and approaches to both subjects. So, if I might ask you, Tom, to kick off in inimitable way. Fine, thank you very much for having me, Tom. Uh, my name's Tom Shakespeare. I'm Professor of Disability Research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I've been doing research into independent living and personal assistance for the last few years. Um, this is a phenomenon that you're familiar with from uh, many, many high-income countries and increasingly some middle-income countries where disabled people have personal budgets to employ workers to support them. Or in some cases, families have money to support their children with disabilities with personal assistance. And the reason this is so popular, the reason that the uh, evaluations are so positive is because it gives flexibility to disabled people in living in the community and it promotes informality. Folk don't want to be in institutions, we just heard that. So what is the cost-effective, flexible way of enabling them to be empowered? And rather than paying for a large state bureaucracy to administer and regulate, if you give funding to disabled people, sometimes their wage uh, structures are administered by disabled people's organizations, but the feedback from disabled people is this is very, very positive, this personalization. It enables them to participate in education and employment and society. And uh, it's cash for care, and disabled people's organizations have said, well, this removes the need for sympathy, for charity, for pity, for emotion. But the research we did said, while it was very empowering, there's still emotion. It's a relationship between people, and relationships always include emotion. So whether or not your country is able to fund personal assistance, or whether we are talking for uh, families or community support, we need to pay attention to those emotions. That's what our study showed, and the ways those relationships can break down. We must empower disabled people, but not at the cost of the people who support them. That's my message. I can talk all day, Tom, but I'll stop there. Sure? I can say more? You want more? No, yeah, okay. Please. Let me let me say thank you. Uh, Caroline, stop you stop me if I'm talking no, nonsense. Um, so what we found in our research, and we researched with uh, 30 disabled people and 28 personal assistants in great depth, what we found is there are three reasons why support relationships can go wrong. And when we researched with people, every single support worker and disabled person had had conflict. This is not always harmonious, because it's a human relationship. If you come from a family with no argument, put up your hand. If you've never had a squabble with your neighbor, put up your hand. I see no hands, yes? Normal. So why are there sources of conflict? The first source of conflict is personal. You just don't get on. In my country, we have a thing called Brexit. Half of us are leavers and half of us are remainers. Families have been split. We're not all happy, I can assure you. Those sorts of disputes, or disputes about religion or sexuality or anything else, you don't really want to work closely with somebody who differs from you so profoundly. How can we solve this? Interview the people we work with. Give them probationary periods. Accept that you're not gonna get on with everybody, and that's fine. Just make sure that you can live separate but equal lives. The second source of conflict is practical. Do you keep the cleaning products under the sink or do you put them on the top of the sink? Do you have a session? No, you see, we would be arguing, Harold, I mean, very quickly about, <laughs> now, do you put the milk in you're first or the milk in <laughs> afterwards? Well, if you're working for me, I have ideas and I want you to do it my way. Yeah. So, practical. No, you don't 
bring me to the bath like that. You do it like this. Practical disagreements, you need to get them sorted. And if I'm employing you, I probably need to have a little uh, contract and I need to have a little list of what you need to do. We could discuss it, but I am the boss. So those sorts of uh, practical uh, conflicts. How do you deal with that? Probation period, clarity of instruction, um, a, a list of what I expect from you, negotiation. I don't want to be unreasonable. You don't want to pay no attention. And if you say you've got the skill to use my hoist, I want you to have that skill. Don't just lie about it, otherwise you're out the door. So the third source of possible conflict is, oh my God, Caroline, we've been spending day upon day upon day together. I am so irritated with you. And even, even me, perfect me, is you know, <laughs> annoying you a little bit because we have spent too much time together. So what is the solution? Holidays. Holidays. <laughs> Different staff for different days. No, I wouldn't call it the naughty corner. I would call it the personal assistant room, where you might want a bit of space. We all want space from each other in families, in support relationships. Wherever we live, we want space. So there are ways of understanding the sources of conflict. Remember, personal, practical, proximal. Proximal means just being close to each other all the time. We can solve these problems. We can have happy support relationships. We can avoid the conflicts that sometimes end up in court that end up with personal assistance leaving. And I'll say one more thing. In order for personal assistance to work, we need to have a choice. I need to have a choice. I might want to, Tom to work with me, not you, I'm sorry. I need to be able to choose. You both apply for the job, and I decide that because Tom and I have a great liking for Pilates, we belong together in a way that you and I don't. And I'm sorry, somebody else will employ you. Or you might decide that you don't want to work with somebody as horrible as me. And that is fair enough. But that only works if I have a choice of who I employ. If I live in a rural area, if the pool of personal assistance workers is small, then I might not have any choice at all. So the cash for care, the uh, personalization doesn't work. And in order to make sure that we have enough workers in this field, we need to make sure they're respected, they have terms and conditions, they have uh, uh, hourly pay that is much better than working on the checkout in the supermarket. They are contributing emotionally and personally a great deal to our independence and our empowerment. And we need to remember that. They might need supervision. They might need a support group. We don't want you gossiping about us. Please don't gossip. Professionalism is really important. But uh, we need to facilitate this wonderfully empowering independent living arrangement to make it work. And remember, it's new. We've never done this before. You may have seen Downton Abbey on the, ra on the television and think it's just about upstairs, downstairs, off you go, servant lady. It's not. We don't have the metaphor for understanding. And I want to leave you with one metaphor which works. Not master and servant. Um, not family. You're not part of my family. Paid friend is a bit weird because as soon as I start paying you, you're not really a friend. But you're my colleague. We are in a shared enterprise. The enterprise is my independence. We need to work together to make that happen. And my independence is your job satisfaction, not just the payment. And we need to remember that. People are personal assistants because they're young people in transition. They're women returning to the labor market, and they're migrants looking for a first step on the ladder. It might not be a job forever, but it's a fantastic way of empowering people, and we need to be thankful to them and to make sure they want to do this work, which means not exploiting them. So empower disabled people, support personal assistance. We're going to have a much more healthy independent living arrangement. I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed, like Tom. Jamin, if I may ask you to introduce yourself and tell us where your research has taken you and some of your findings, and in particular on, on the budget side, and um, tell us how things are going. Okay, so I take the mic off. Hello. Uh, good late morning. Um, thank you for invite, inviting me to this session. My name is Jamin Weber, and I'm a professor in clinical psychology here at the University of Vienna. And in addition, um, I am president to Lebenshilfe Österreich, uh, which would be translated to English, Inclusion 
uh, Austria, so working for um, um, people with intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities here in Austria and serving for over 11,000 uh, persons over here. So um, we are, uh, from that point, I am directly attached to the issue of personal budget, of personal assistance, of um, autonomy, of self-determination in people with intellectual disabilities especially, and but for personally also for all people with disabilities to have access to uh, fulfill their dreams and have the means for fulfilling their, their dreams in their life. So that is my background here in, in, in Vienna. Originally I'm coming from Luxembourg and I will come later to some experiences also from Luxembourg, what is going on there on the political uh, level in terms of, um, of, of personal budget and of um, personal assistance over there. Um, so let me first um, say something. Um, Tom Shakespeare was uh, saying, I am the boss. I think that is a very important point, I am the boss. And let me um, share with you um, a short memory. It is about 15 to 17 years ago when I had a meeting in Birmingham at the University of Birmingham, and I had first time within the European project it was, and we came from continental Europe to advanced disability uh, conceptions in the UK, huh? and we were sitting there with self-advocates on the table, and, um, and these self-advocates were accompanied by, uh, by their personal assistants, and the personal assistants were sitting in the second row, and the people with uh, developmental disabilities, the self-advocates were sitting on the table just with us, and we discussed some issues. And um, sometimes um, a person, a uh, self-advocate, he would, um, when he wanted to have an support, he would go back and ask his, uh, um, his um, uh, personal assistant to do something and to, to give him some, uh, some, some comments or some, uh, some information he was looking for and, um, and then addressing us again. And so when we came to a break and when this relation was, uh, was seen that it was strange or new for us, one of these self advocates you know, these guys here, they are our slaves. He didn't say, <laughs> I am, <laughs> I am the, we are the boss. So he, he was smiling with it and they accepted it. And now I come to emotions. So mm. Even joking, huh, which is an expression of emotion, is something that has to be in, uh, included in such a relation. Mm. And that was a, a positive joke. It was not a bad joke. It was a positive joke. And um, the... Um, uh, the people supporting this, uh, the personal assistants, were also smiling very positively, mm -hmm. and nobody was upset about it. And probably they didn't hear it for the first time at, yeah. on, on that day. Huh? So that is um, um, an introduction. Emotion is um, um, very important in that relation, and maybe we can come back uh, to this later. But um, when coming back, when you are asking me, Tom, um, what is saying the research, not only our research in, in Austria, we have little research on this, on the outcomes, on, but generally, internationally, it is known that quality of life is improved. So mm -hmm. that is the, the main issue. And, um, and I think um, we all would share the saying that for ourselves, it is very important when it comes to topics of our own life that we are sitting in the driver's place of the car, that we decide if we go right on, or take a turn on left, or take a turn on, on the right side, and not sitting on the bench at the back rear. So that is a, a major um, view on, on what is said to, to empower people with disabilities when it comes to uh, what are their dreams in their lives and where want, they want to, to head for, and to so support them in their programs, in their plans, in their projects of, of their uh, everyday life, but also of their life in five years from now to build up some uh, perspectives. And let me go back a little bit, in which, which comes to uh, re research or to science-driven things. And science-driven things are not something that is done in a laboratory. There, uh, sometimes it is done in a laboratory, but it's very often um, a discussion in our societies going on on major principles, how we set up our societies and how we offer rights to people living in our societies. And when I go to the medievals, we were setting up the first legal uh, conventions. And these conventions were typically set up to give power to a few, to have power over many people. Huh? 
And um, with the beginning of the 19th century, we had a new conception of this model. It came to the conception where, that we would um, um, offer rights for women and for men on an equal basis. That is, is the beginning of the 19th century, and that is where we are dis discussing right now the equal rights for people with disabilities in mm. our societies. Mm. So that is also an, an, a cultural advancement from, uh, from jurisprudence, you could say, uh, to our uh, society. So, to claim um, to go away from op oppression, to go away from discrimination, to go away from poverty, and to, um, to prevent social upheavals, to prevent wars between uh, different societal groups. Huh? That is something that is very, very important to remind us what is the basis of this. And then, um, um, why are we doing this? I think that is not because we are thinking in a legal way, but because we have um, something like a moral reflex in it. So that is our first nature saying us that it is not right that another person should not have access to something and only myself should have access to this. That is something that is disturbing us from a moral point of view very much. And that is the basics for um, putting up these frameworks in, in conventions in, or in legal, legal rights. So, um, and then it comes to um, um, what is driving us, all of us sitting here around in the conference uh, in our lives. Uh, and we are looking to, fulf to fulfill more or less our basic needs. Hmm? Our basic needs. And that is an, a major point, what are the needs of people with disabilities when it comes to be supported. Huh? So the basic needs model is very prominent. And here we are coming to psychology, to my, to my field and which refers very much to my reflections in, uh, in when it comes to, um, to personal assistance and to personal budget. The basic needs is a, motivational, um, a motivation theory um, and um, saying that um, people really are looking for it, that um, we um, have personal achievements, that we grow during our life and that we have goals which we want to uh, to achieve and that we um, uh, want to contribute and that we want to act personally within societies. So basic needs model is saying that um, there are three basic needs um, for people and one would be competence. Everybody is going to be competent in what he or she is doing and to learn something, to get to, to, uh, to achieve competence and to be self-efficacious uh, uh, and to learn. The second uh, basic needs would be autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, that would reflect on self-management, to set up the paths of one's own life by taking own decisions about yourself, oneself. And the third basic need is social belonging, huh? to, to be in a group, um, to participate. Huh? So that is the basic needs model uh, that has been um, designed, set up in the early 80s uh, by Ryan and Ditchy, colleagues from the United States. It is not an US-driven liberal or neoliberal uh, theory behind it. It is really, it has been um, uh, researched uh, worldwide in different cultures and you find in all these countries these three basic needs. And it is independent of uh, your political arrangements in your country. It is the basic needs you can see. And here it comes in um, um, uh, very much to, um, uh, to what we observe still going on in our societies, some ethical principles when we um, um, plan or, or, um, or, or try to uh, be helpful to other persons, even in our private non-disabled person. If you want to help somebody else, our children or my wife, then I could opt for a very paternalistic uh, approach, or I could opt for a more uh, respectful self-determination approach for that person. So, um, and, and that is an ethical, a moral approach that um, says that uh, where we have a change, um, going from um, I know what is best for you and what's good for your well-being to asking persons what are your dreams, what do you want to achieve, and what is good for you in your opinion. Huh? 
And then we come to um, the issue of abilities. That is the, f the, first, uh, the first point I want to discuss a little bit, to the term of abilities. And then we know many persons have many abilities and can uh, be very independent uh, of other persons, can perform mostly everything. But also, um, not having myself the label, though I wearing eyeglasses, to be a disabled person, I need support of some persons, even while I'm sitting over here. Uh, and I would imagine now I have small children, young children, and I have some resp responsibility towards these children, then I need another person to support me and to take over these charges I would have to support my own children. Huh? So you understand what I, what I mean. So we, we, we need always support, and we organize this support on, an, on a very um, reciprocal uh, way uh, and a balanced way we are looking for, for, for it. So, and, and then we have abilities, and then you have people who have abilities which are not really um, present. And the non-presence of these abilities does not say that they do not have these abilities, but these abilities might be covered, might be latent, might be hidden abilities. So there have been probably developmental restrictions in their life so that they couldn't show that they had these disabilities. And on the other hand, we have abilities uh, which are missing or which have been lost. And there we come to impairment, huh? to the concept of impairment. So, and um, with uh, abilities not being present, either covered or being lost or being impaired, uh, you come to the situation that a person has big problems in participation, hmm? in general in participation. Big issues are coming up for the person. And um, then we are coming um, uh, to, um, and they have restrictions in, in participation. And, um, and then we um, are starting to rethink our support to people who have lost abilities or who have hidden abilities to offer them support. And then not the support in a paternalistic way, but the support in, in, in a way where we have a dialogue with the person. What are the dreams of that, of that, of that individual? What are his, uh, his next goals? What, what are the work areas he wants to, to, uh, to access? And then we are defining with him the needs of support to reach these goals. Hmm? And then we come to a calculation. Um, what does that cost, these needs of, 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 for, for your support, for your personal support? And then we have the personal budget. So now here comes one more time research in, where we contribute, where we contribute from psychology. What is a good instrument to detect and to assess in an objective way the kind of needs of support of a person. And there we have a different, um, different, right. um, a different kind of tools which we have, uh, which are on offer and which have to be evalu evaluated in each country and which each country uh, will, will opt to use for going in this, in this direction. And um, one of the big issues is to have an, a fair assessment of the needs of support of any person with disabilities and how you can do it. You will do it when you develop such an instrument. You would use something which, which we call psychometrics, which is something that is valid, that is reliable, that has um, something like an, 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 a very good um, convergent view of different stakeholders in the process of defining the needs of, of support of a person, where the person with disability has a big say in it. Huh? There is not only he or himself in this, there is a dialogue in it, but there would be an instrument that has been validated huh? and that has a good sound uh, objectivity in it. And, and then it is um, applied um, in, an, um, in, in, an, in a way of various dialogues with various stakeholders around him. And, and then um, this, um, 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 the, the findings of such an assessment could be translated in uh, the kind of the level and the intensity of support of that, of that person and also of the, of the level of competence the support person must have to offer a good support for that person. That can be on an 
on the high qualification level or on the lower qualification level. And, and the ending of this would be a general sum that is defined within the program of this. So that would be the, the, the program when you come from uh, the right perspective to a concrete application of how you can implement uh, such a system of uh, personal um, assistance and personal budget. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Germain. Joris, can you tell us who you are and where you've been and what you're doing and how that fits in with what Germain and Tom have been telling us? Yes, of course. Thank you for having me here, uh, Tom, and thank you for the people who have done a fantastic job uh, organizing uh, the conference. I've been here three days. I've been here three years early um, in 2015, yeah. and I see that I've seen that the conference has grown. I've seen that it has become much more, even much more diverse than ever. So congratulations on that. Um, my name is Joris. Uh, it's if, for native English speakers, you might say George, which means countryman. Um, I'm just um, a researcher from Belgium. I'm a lecturer. I do some uh, practice-based research. Uh, we've recently completed um, um, a study, a survey, on how people experience the new personal budget system in Belgium, in, in the Flanders region of Belgium. And, uh, well, we, we try to, to not only look at effects, but also how people perceive, perceive uh, the new system, how they cope with the new system, how they feel about the new system. So it's not entirely about the personal relationship with assistance, um, or it's more about the system itself, how they have how they have a right to a personal budget or not, uh, how they uh, feel about the negotiations when they uh, try to, to get the support they need, uh, how they, uh, what kind of information they get when, when, when they uh, are negotiating with care providers. So it's all fairly new. I'm, go I'm just going to give some, um, some numbers. Okay. Just, just a couple. So, um, in 2008, in, in Flanders, there were uh, 37,000 people listed as, having, as, as uh, having a disability, and but not always uh, have a, a right to the uh, um, disability support. Eh? Yeah. Okay. That's grown in 2017 to seven, um, 57,000 people. So, um, and already. 37,000 people of those uh, 57,000 get uh, some kind of personalized care. So that's, that's great. Um, it's, it's, it's not always in direct payment. Uh, people can choose to have direct payment, cash. They can also choose for a voucher system or uh, for a combination. So they can have uh, care as such or uh, care uh, and cash, or a combination of both. It's up to their, it's their own choice, but what we do see now is that in the system, because we have a classic, still classic system of community care, not total institutions of <laughs> or anything like that, but still group homes and, and stuff like that, and uh, people are more inclined to choose uh, um, a voucher system. So I have numbers on that too. So we, we know that 8.5% chooses cash, 4 chooses a combination, and 87.5% chooses vouchers. These are numbers from 2017. Yes. Okay, that's just, just the context of what I'm saying here. Um, I think what we see in, in when people uh, try to negotiate and try to get the support they need is that... Um, well, in our survey, in our sample, in our research, there was, there was a well-educated sample, actually, with people with um, a, a lot of people had a higher degree, even. And we see that um, a third of our, our people, our respondents, didn't know uh, basic facts about the system, because it's a very complex system. Why is it a complex? It, it didn't seem complex, when, perhaps, when I sketched it uh, just before, but there are 
a number of rules about assessment, about do I have a right, uh, what kind of budget will I get when I, when I, when I do my application and such. Um, and, well, people need to be better informed. That's a, one major lesson uh, from our research. Huh? So um, we asked um, persons with disabilities themselves and uh, the people who support them, the informal carers, because um, uh, in some cases, the people, for example, with intellectual disabilities can't always speak for themselves. They, they can, but in, in these kind of matters, often family uh, tries to get the best budget for the child with an intellectual disability. Well, the, the, the informal carers who who try to get uh, a grip on the system, uh, report that, uh, that they're more skeptical about because they want to, their child or their family member to be protected and not, not be autonomous. It's, it's, it's uh, difficult to explain because I'm not that proficient in English, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean? They're more uh, worrisome about the future than, than the persons themselves. Uh, that's another major lesson. Um, yeah, I can go on, but yeah. I, I won't. I, I okay. want what to I'm going to do is I'm going to come back yeah. to you. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll come back, Joris. Thank you so much. Yeah. Because I want, to, I want actually to address, I think, um, three issues that you've brought up. With Tom, I want to address the whole issue of cash and emotion. And um, Germain, I want to talk with you um, not only about how research can contribute, but also the issue of um, needs, but also wishes. And then Joris, um, the whole concept of how do you get you, the information out there in the most efficient and the most effective way, um, and how you can have a system where people just don't give up because of the bureaucracy, or they try and game the bureaucracy to make as much money as they can. So, Tom, coming back to you, you said that um, there is this kind of tension between paying cash, potentially removing the role of emotion in support arrangements. Um, in, in your research and um, your thinking, what, how do you address this issue? I think that um, you have to acknowledge that uh, people are in the care sector for different reasons. Um, they're often not paid as much as they might in other sectors, um, but they have got a commitment to equality a lot of the time. Not everybody, not all the time. And I think we need to um, foster relationships which are healthy, which promote inclusion, and which have the potential to promote equality. I mean, what we're hearing from uh, 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 Belgium, from Flanders, is uh, that many parents of, uh, of adults with intellectual disabilities are worried about them. And that is, that is an emotion, fear. Um, and they fear that so-called independent living will make their child vulnerable. Um, I imagine, I'm, I'm hypothesizing, there is something there in part of that. And so I think we need to, as people in the disability rights movement show, explore, and promote setups where actually this empowerment minimizes the risk. Because we know there are risks in all settings. Institutions are full of abuse, and there's exploitation in all sorts of settings. So we need to have some sort of regulation, some sort of brokerage. And in Sweden, with the uh, 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 model they have there, you have a person with intellectual disability, you have their support workers, and then you have uh, the JAG system, you have a service broker who makes sure that's a good relationship. So that if we're together in a private setting, you come along and check that she is supporting me, not exploiting me. Uh, or indeed, that I am being you know, uh, uh, empowered, but not dominating her in an appropriate way. Because in the past, trade unions supported people, municipalities inspected homes, wasn't always good. But here we have a privatized relationship, just us in my home, who knows what goes on. And there is an understandable fear. So I think we need to uh, acknowledge the motivations that have, people have, the fears that others who are influential in their lives have, and make space to talk about that. 
and to make, and sometimes, um, you know, I could fall in love with you. We spend all our time together. Um, we had in our study uh, a, a person who did fall in love with his personal assistant. Um, and then she left because she was a student here for the summer. And there was tearful scenes at airports and all the rest of it. And he determined that he was going to have boundaries. So I think we need to empower disabled people to understand these intense emotions and to ensure that they can operate boundaries, that they can be safe, and indeed that the personal assistance can be safe. Because this is a relationship which is very intense, potentially. We spend a lot of time together. We are in very intimate, private settings. My home is your workspace. That's very odd. Sometimes we had personal assistants who said, you know, the disabled person has no privacy here because they, they, as they have high support needs, they almost surrender that, but I want privacy. So the disabled person was saying, you're my friend. And she was saying, no, I'm friendly. Different thing, friendly friend. And so the personal assistant, the care worker, trying to protect her privacy in a context where the disabled person lacked theirs. So I think paying attention to these very, I mean, you know, I'm so glad we have psychologists here. These are intense feelings. Um, it's a very intimate relation. Uh, there is a, a risk of exploitation. We found that. We found unscrupulous care workers who were basically abusing their clients. And we found the other way around, where you are a migrant worker. You have no rights. You live in my home. I pay you, you know, what is statutory, but no more, and I dominate you and bully you, and you have no exit. Where would you go except back to Bulgaria or wherever you come from? So, you know, the, both parties can be vulnerable, both parties can be exploited, and there are a lot of emotions flying around. Um, and I think we need to avoid dependency. The whole point of independent living is to reduce dependency, and we can do that by having options, choice, surveillance, support for you, advice for me, the role of disabled people's organizations or other organizations are really important. I've never been an employer before. I've been exploited all my life. And suddenly you're giving me a lot of cash and saying she works for me. What do I do? It requires a level of maturity and support. Training. In uh, Britain, the, uh, uh, I use that word correctly, the, the disabled person is the boss. In Norway, you would be employed by a care cooperative, I would be your manager, but not your boss. And you can immediately see how that might change it. Uh, you know, somebody else pays you and employs you, I manage you. Uh, and that is very important, I determine what you do and how you support me, but I'm not in control of you. And so all of these are options for relationships, whether it's intellectual disabled people, whether it's children and their parents. One uh, personal assistant said, I'm trying to support him. And then his mother rings up and says, have you fed him his lunch? Give him this, do it in this way. And he's saying, I want to enable this disabled person to be independent. And mum is butting in all the time and stopping him being independent, overprotecting him. But what do I do as the support worker? Is it my role to get on the side of the disabled person against mum? Or is it, I, that, that's not my role. I come, I do the care, I go away. Do you see what I mean? There are lots of boundary issues, questions we ne need to negotiate. So what I'm saying is that we need to acknowledge emotion, make space for emotion. It might be mediation, it might be supervision, it might be support. It might be training and advice. But if we don't name it, then it's invisible and it can do harm. So there's nothing wrong here. It's, it, it, it is still potentially a very empowering relationship. I can see why my, people might fear it, but we need to enable it to work. Thank you very, thank you very much indeed, Tom. Joris, in, in, in your um, experience in Belgium, um, Tom was talking about the cash aspect, but what is it, 87% are taking vouchers? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and I want, first I want to say I, I agree with uh, what uh, Tom said about um, it's a matter of learning people and to empower people to, to be their own, uh, to be the, the, the boss, to be, uh, to be an authority in the relationship and to, 
to what we call uh, demand-driven support so, so that, that the person can have um, a real say and control the means. And not only, um, well, there's, there's, there's lots of things to say about it, but I, I, I do agree. What I might add is that uh, we, what we see is that not, of, or, or what we think we see is that um, also, a majority of the people with uh, a disability or uh, where disability is suspected in these early stages where, where you don't know what you need in your life and, and what you will need as support, there's a, there's a, a, a large group of vulnerable people who, who identify themselves as having, probably having a disability but don't know yet for sure, is that, is that they... Um, is that, is, is that they not always want the, the administration and the paperwork and, and they say, well, let please somebody be there for me to, to, to advise me, to, to, let, to give me my rights, of course, and let that be, please let that be one person, like you said, a, a, a case, manager, case manager. Well, they don't say that, but we, 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 uh, what they say is we talk to, to, to so many people we see so many different opinions uh, in the professionals who, who tell us this or that. We want somebody to, that, that, that uh, um, uh, empowers us, that gives us the right information. And from the beginning till the end, because, because it's, 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 otherwise it's too uh, complex. And, and, uh, and we have, in, in Flanders, we have supported decision making. We have specialized services to do that. But they make a plan for somebody. They help to get... To, to, to draft a plan, a, a plan is necessary to get a budget. But then they, then they have to let go. Yeah. They, they are obliged to let the person go. And then uh, it's, well, it's not ideal. No. Thanks so much, Joris. Germain. Um, picking up on what has been discussed by Tom and Yuri, um, I think it is um, very important to have also an evaluation system within uh, this whole process of uh, personal budget and personal assistance in it that uh, prevents uh, some of the major negative issues in it and that we can learn out of the system. Also on the personal way, if the personal assistance as it has been established the first time is really um, the best model for myself as a person with disability and to reflect on this. And uh, so that is an, a general remark on, on, on it. And um, as you said, uh, I should make some contribution on, 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 on basic on needs and on, on the wishes. So, yeah. um, um, I think um, this, the sky is not the limit so, when it comes to wishes. So, um, but we can wish everything. Huh? But, and then we have, in addition, to come back on the realistic discussion with the persons. And let me give you an, an example, a very practical example, from my own experience with persons now with learning disabilities when they are growing up when they are adult persons and they see their sisters, their brothers, and they have all earned the driver's license, and I didn't get it. Huh? My parents opposed it to me to, to go for a driver's license, huh? and I was forbidden to it. And now they are meeting this kind guy, Germain, there, and, and they are trying to, to get encouragement and to change the mind of the parents. So I had a couple of these situations in my life. And, um, and then I asked these young people of 24, 25 people, let's go to the Viennese amusement park, to the Prater. Let's go for a go-kart drive together. Hmm? And then we went to a go-kart drive together. And then the experience, and I, we learned them how to handle the the driving wheel, and there is a gas pedal, and a brake pedal, and that's all. No gears, nothing. Huh? And, and you just go, and you curve around. But there are no um, pedestrians around, and so it is a very easy situation. Huh? And then they find out, even after the fifth time, I met them over there, and I invited them again to go over there, that this is not the situation they want to go in. And then their dream of a driver, and their wish of a driver's license, has become a very realistic um, uh, cognitive perception for them. And they say, well, this is nothing for me. Hmm? And then it is their own decision yeah. that they say, no, this is not the way I want to go. 
that, that is a, a way you can, uh, you, you can handle it. So, uh, I, I, I just want to tell you, you one story from Iceland. <laughs> so there's a, a young man with intellectual disabilities, and he had a personal assistant. And somebody said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a taxi driver. And people said, well, hang on a minute, as we just heard. I, you, you know, that, that's, I'm not sure you can do that. He said, of course I can. My personal assistant will do the driving, and yeah. I'll do the talking. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, in his yeah. experience, yeah. taxi drivers are people who talk to you. That's good. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. I agree on this. But, um, but he would not have the driver's license. Yes. So I was yeah. talking about the driver's license. Yes. But I fully agree on, on the model uh, you uh, present us when it comes to personal assistance. <laughs> then he could enjoy it and could, could talk to it. And, uh, and, the, and his personal assistant could be more attentive to the traffic that is ahead. And yeah. it would be, be a more safe drive. You, give it, you even could uh, announce it like this. And, uh, and, um, and you would see that more people would like to, to have a, safe, a safer drive than only a taxi driver's drive. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be. So um, we are running out of time. Yes, I I'm, I'm yeah. Germain, that's, thank you so much. I'm just going to ask Tom very quickly, in, if I may, in two minutes to s sum up what do you think of the three most pertinent points that what you consider the three most pertinent points vis-a-vis -vis personal assistance? Well, I, I'm going to try and sum up uh, uh, this little uh, wonderful conversation. And I'm hearing that disabled people are very different. They're at different stages in their lives. They have different needs. They have different relations. And that's really important. We can't have one size fits all. I'm hearing that we need an assessment process which is transparent, which is reliable, and which also has the faith of families, citizens, and city administrators. We need that to work for everybody. Um, I'm, for me, I think I was emphasizing that we need space for emotions and that relationship between a disabled person and the support worker. But one thing we haven't mentioned, and which I think is absolutely vital, is the envelope of funding for this process. Because in Britain, we had the CARE Act, which was a wonderful act, but not funded. And if there is not a package of funding to enable this to take place, then disabled people's needs will come third or fourth down the list, and that's a problem. And if the local authority is looking to make cuts, this is a very appealing pot of money. So I would like to see it ring-fenced, nationally administered, and those relationships can be the fullest empowering relationships for, for disabled people. And remember, independent disabled people shop, work, pay, participate, that's good for the worker and for the disabled person and for their family, and that's what we're trying to empower. But this really gets to the heart of what, who it's for, how it's administered, how it's transparent, and how it can empower. So I hope that's been helpful for everybody. Thank and you thank very you much indeed, and I think here. all of us would thank Caroline for being with us, Professor Tom Shakespeare, Professor Germain Weber, and Dr. Joris van Peirenbroek. May I say thanks to you all as well. Thank you. Thank you. That's the quietest I have ever been. Yeah, it's, good for you. <laughs> it's good for me to be quiet. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I was asked to join the panel um, for because actually it was a panel of four wonderful men, um, and Tom rightly said, "Where is the diversity on the panel?" And actually, I wanted to acknowledge that we have really had very equal gender equality on our panels. Actually, an awful lot more women <laughs> have been sitting on the panels, but this particular one. But I think what Tom is doing is constantly reminding us um, we always have to be mindful of the different needs that every single one of us experiences. And as I was sitting on the panel, it, I was really aware, because I wasn't supposed to be sitting on that panel, is that I, as a person who has a visual impairment, have very specific needs, which I don't speak about. And that listening around the importance of formalizing and professionalizing the caring industry is so important, because the need to be seen as who we are and to be understood fully is not just as important for the person with a disability, but for the person working with them as well. And when we talk about inclusion and equality, 
we need to ensure the equal role of every single individual. So from my perspective, sitting on that panel and listening to the three gentlemen and Tom, I had a huge learning, but also realizing how slow I am in saying my own needs. And it is a constant, it's a constant journey of acceptance. So I just want to say a huge thank you. Please, a round of applause for that, I thought, incredibly informative panel. We are absolutely delighted, and I'm sorry for the delay, um, but it is a real honour. It is a real honour to have the President of the Austrian Parliament here with us today. Thank you very much. We are in your home, in your home country, and with Martin Essel and the Zero Project Conference, which is here now 11 years. And this has now become a global convening of disability activists and solutions all around the world in this wonderful country, in these headquarters. We cannot thank you enough for coming here and we want to acknowledge and appreciate all you have done, your country, Martin Nessel, and for you being here today. So Wolfgang, please join the panel and thank you very, very much for your time. This is the President of the Austrian Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Royal Highness, dear Ambassador, but especially dear Martin Essel, I'm really impressed what you have done in the past. I'm the first time here. It is really, for me, a very emotional uh, meeting here and uh, what you have done in the conference and especially also in the exhibition outside. Therefore, I would have liked to thank you for your invitation and to speak to you today. The Zero Project Conference in Vienna, organized by Martin Essel Foundation, has become a great tradition. It raises awareness for disabled people and their specific needs. I see it my personal duty to be here. We live in a time of change. Bigger, faster, higher. Further is the measure of things a common need by an overall presence of social media. However, we should not forget about those closest to us, and among them, people with disabilities of whatever kind. If we want an inclusive society, we need to ensure that people with disabilities participate in society as a whole and especially in political life. We must also do everything we can to ensure that they are able to shape their lives in a self-determined way. As president of the National Council, I would like to raise the question. What can parliaments do to enable persons with disabilities to participate in the political process? Parliament is the heart of our democracy. It is precisely here that barrier-free access must be guaranteed. First, because parliament is a role model, laws are made here. Second, because it is a meeting place and we have to ensure access for our citizens, including disabled persons. And third, because Parliament also has to task to bring democracy closer to the citizens. For example, through democracy workshops all over the country. It is therefore important to allow all citizens to participate in democracy education offered by Parliament. Parliament has three key roles that affect disabled people in different ways. First, the primary role of Parliament is to make laws. These laws have implications for people with disabilities, sometimes directly, but much more often indirectly. 
Therefore, Parliament must take into account the specific needs of people with disabilities in the legislative process, also due to international obligations. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is a milestone in this context. This treaty requires all UN member states to protect the rights and dignity of persons with disabilities. It sets a common standard in legislation and enforcement. The protection and promotion of rights of disabled persons are high on Austria's agenda. In order to implement the UN conven uh, Convention, Austria has drawn up a national action plan on disability. The current Austrian government has made barrier-free participation for people with disabilities a main priority. Let me quote, quote from the coalition agreement. People with disabilities must be able to participate, participate without barriers in our society, economy, and public life as a whole. Individual autonomy of people with disabilities must therefore be supported in all areas. Second, apart from the place where laws are made, Parliament also is an institution with its own administration. As such, Parliaments are places of actual physical encounters. People from all over society come and go here every day. These include people with disabilities. The Austrian Parliament is currently being renovated. Two cents principle will be applied for the renovated building. This means that an optical as well as an acoustic or tactile orientation aid will be provided. Let me mention a few adaptions that are planned. For those with limited mobility, there will be barrier-free lift facilities, lifting platforms, and stair lift spirit, free toilets and showers. There will be eight wheelchair places in the plenary hall, door buttons and card readers will provide automatic door openings. For the hearing impaired, there will be inductive hearing systems. Visually impaired people are supported in entering the building, and floor markings are applied in particular on main routes. Third, Parliament is also a place of political and democratic communication. Like everyone else, people with disabilities need to understand how democracy works, how laws are created and affect them. A blind person has to be able to read on the home page what his member of parliaments have decided. People with difficulties in comprehension must be able to follow the political debate. In order to meet the specific needs of disabled people, the Austrian Parliament has taken following action. And I have seen, and before I come in the conference hall, I've seen a lot of um, aids and a lot of supporters, new ones, and we're impressed. I think we have to think over for our next session in our Parliament. But What's in our parliament going on? The parliament's web content is largely barrier-free. Almost the entire site can be interpreted by screen readers. Sign language has been used since 2009. Plenary sessions, sessions are interpreted. Parliament is also striving for accessibility in the written language. For people with reading or spelling difficulties, we provide information in easy German. This is just to give you an idea of what parliaments can do to support people with disabilities and I have learned in the few minutes we are here, I have learned a lot, thank you. The focus of this conference is on independent living and political participation. These aspects are the core elements of our democracy. We all strive for a self-determined and good life. Only democracy and political participation enable us to turn these aspirations into reality for everyone. And if I say everyone, 
I mean everyone, including people with disabilities. Let us keep in mind that the society is judged by how it treats all of its citizens, especially those with specific needs. All steps taken to protect and promote the rights of disabled people make our society more inclusive. Some progress has been made, but much remains to be done. Let us move forward together. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Sawaka. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being here. Okay. Um, we are now actually still on time. Um, we are just about to break into our parallel sessions for the last part of the conference. So before we do, I want to ask you a few things. Um, number one, I want to make sure all of you have your lunch vouchers. As you know, lunch is open between half 11 and two. Second is, will you continue to tweet hashtag ZeroCon19 because we have got so much tweets and the conversation is out there and we really appreciate it because it makes sure the people that are not in the room can be part of our conversation. Now, lastly, feedback. One of the things that's been really important to us the whole, every single year, we invite you to give us feedback. Please make sure that you do that. We will be in the closing session, we'll be telling you exactly how, but just be mindful and thinking about some of the things that you can share with us so that we can continuously improve the Zero Project Conference for you. Um, but now all I have to do is say, off to your parallel sessions. Make sure you swap the cards, have the conversations before you leave. A huge thank you, and we'll see you back here in the room at four o'clock for our final storytelling session. So enjoy the next few hours. Take care, bye.